The subject is how Christ appeals to our hearts. And we'll be looking at three seemingly, though this is not the right word, seemingly incidental events connected with the cross of Calvary. And yet they are mighty events and they are deeply significant events and they teach and they help us immensely, especially in coming to Christ. So first of all then from verse 38, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And our first heading really is how salvation is accomplished. The tearing of the temple veil. I can't give you the exact statistics of this veil. Veil is hardly the right word for it. It was an enormous tapestry. It was in sections probably but it was rigid and a tapestry. Josephus, the Jewish historian who was born just three, four years after the death of Christ, he describes it in his work as four inches thick. I cannot understand how it could have been quite as thick as that. Josephus at times exaggerates, but it was certainly thicker than the kind of tapestry we may visualize, enormously thick. And it was basically composed of fine linen. It was huge. It guarded the way to the Holy of Holies. There was the inner court of the temple and that gave way right in the center of the temple to the Holy of Holies, into which no one could enter but the high priest, only once a year, after all the due ceremonial cleansing, he could go in just once a year to offer atonement for the people on the annual Day of Atonement. But otherwise, this was a forbidden place. In that Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant. In that Holy of Holies, God was symbolically, mightily present. And this veil guarded it. It was significant. It said to the people in the time of the Jews, in ancient times, the way into the presence of God for sinful men and women, the way to approach him is not yet accomplished. Oh, the message even in Old Testament times is you may seek him in your hearts and you may find him and you may pray to him and trust in him and you may love him but you must trust that the day will come when there will be a mighty sacrifice beyond anything that we offer in the temple these are just token sacrifices symbolic sacrifices they have no literal efficacy or effect God has ordained them as a picture to us. The blood must be shed and there must be a mighty sacrifice to come. Somehow God must do a great thing to atone for sin, to do away with sin. And that great veil barred the way into the Holy of Holies. This is still a future event, it said. This has not yet taken place. We may come to God in Old Testament times on the basis of what will one day be achieved, what will one day be accomplished for all generations who believe in him, past, present, and future. The veil was, uh, the tapestry was worked with threads of blue and of purple and of scarlet, and Josephus adds, if he's right, that it was said there were gold threads also. And they were woven into this giant tapestry in such a way that all the panoply of heaven was represented. 
This isn't in the scripture, this is Josephus. This is what it looked like. It reminded you of the skies, the firmament on high, the heavens. But that was only the background, somehow very wonderfully worked in. But the major feature was the cherubim, in the plural sense. The cherubim, the angels of justice that guarded the holiness, the throne of God. So that great tapestry represented the barrier holding men and women away from God. They could approach him by faith, but the literal barrier, the burden of human sin, was still not yet compensated for atoned for, done away with, not until the coming of Christ, the Messiah promised through the Old Testament days, who would come and who would suffer and die, who would be the ultimate fulfillment of all the token symbolic sacrifices. God himself would come, having assumed human flesh and personality, and he would take the punishment of sin on behalf of all who would be saved. So no wonder when Christ yielded up his soul to God on Calvary's cross, to God the Father, having borne away the punishment of sin, no wonder by a miracle, by an act of God, that mighty tapestry was torn in two because the way was now open. What powerful symbolism it was. The veil, the barrier, depicting on it the cherubim of justice guarding the way to God's holiness. It had gone. It was at least 15 feet wide, but we don't know the length of it because although the Holy of Holies was shaped, well, evenly, it was cubic, 15 feet tall, yet this curtain, it is hinted, was as high as the roof of the inner court of the temple. The temple built by Solomon was 45 feet high, but the rebuilt temple built by Herod was 60 feet high. Was the veil that long? 60 feet by 15? It could well have been because the Gospels say, very dramatically, it was rent, it was torn from the top to the bottom. Somehow that language doesn't fit a 15 foot veil or tapestry. Maybe it was the whole height and the whole veil was torn in two. That's tremendously significant. The old preachers used to call it the first miracle of Christ's death. Wrought by Christ from a distance, they used to say, on Calvary's cross as he expired. That rending of the veil, all that it meant, well, it meant something to the Jews at that time. Even when it happened, priests and Levites would have been in the holy place, not in the Holy of Holies, but in the holy place, because it was the time of day when the incense offering was made. So the holy, the holy place would have been busy, and priests would have been there, and it would have been witnessed and seen. What would it have meant to them? Well, they would soon understand it was the end of the old order. The veil was rent. The time of sacrifices was over. The tokens and the symbols had come to an end. They were prophecies in a way, pictorial prophecies. Christ had now achieved salvation. He had suffered and died, and in six hours, he had borne the eternal weight of punishment 
due to all those who would believe throughout time. An indescribable agony and separation from God, punished in the body, but films cannot depict this because most of the suffering was in, within him and in his soul, the terrible suffering of the punishment of sin. And he cried, it is finished, it is done, I have paid the price of every moment of sin, every act of sin by every single one who would be drawn to the Lord and trust in him. What an accomplishment. No greater feat, no greater accomplishment, no greater transaction in the history of the world. And to mark it, the veil of the temple was ripped apart. The types, the shadows are over. The period of prophecy is fulfilled. The hymn writer says, finish all the types and shadows of the ceremonial law. And that was spoken, not by words, but by a miracle in the temple, in the rending of the veil. But of course, even more to us, the rending of the veil means Christ has accomplished salvation, he's paid the price for us, now the way is open. We may approach God boldly. So we read in the letter to the Hebrews that the veil is the flesh of Christ, as it were. It represents him. With his death, the veil is torn. The way is open. We may have direct access to the Father through Christ, the eternal Son, who is equal to the Father who's made atonement for our sin. Surely we can understand that. We can understand the symbolism. It speaks of the way of salvation, how God has brought it about, the price paid, the accomplishment that secured it, and the access that we now have if we trust in Christ. So that's the first thing to look at. But then I want to fill in here in Mark's Gospel that we're studying between verses 38 and 39. There's something which Matthew records for us, and that is in Matthew 27, verse 51. And the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. Mark leaves it out. I don't know why, under inspiration, Mark has left it out. Only one reason I can think of, and that is, of course, Mark is writing a tract. And he's writing a short book. And he does telescope a few things, because he's writing for unbelievers. And so he leaves various things out to shorten the record. But he leaves out this, that the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. And that's very interesting. You might call it an incidental event of the cross of Calvary, but it's a mighty event. Why did it happen? Why was there an earthquake? Why did God make one? The second, it used to be called, miracle of the death of Christ, the earthquake. And they saw the rocks split in two. And we're often being told that there are rocks in the area of Calvary that are unaccountably split, perhaps from that very date. Who knows? But the rocks were split. Well, the first thing is, it's obvious and not surprising that something very dramatic should mark the death of Christ on Calvary, that there should be an earthquake, that rocks should be riven. That's not so surprising. This is the most magnificent and astonishing event in history, of course. But there are other reasons too. There's something which is of great help to us. 
In Romans 8, the Apostle Paul speaks of how the whole creation groans and travails. It doesn't, but in a sense it does. Paul personifies even inanimate creation. The whole of creation, the whole landscape, the hills and the mountains, he says. Can't you see it? Can't you imagine it? It is as if all creation is groaning and longing and strained, waiting for the last day of time when Christ shall come again. The day of judgment will come and this earth will be destroyed and reconstituted, rebuilt, remade, somehow combined with heaven, made a physical, spiritual place far larger to house all the saved people of God in glorified bodies for all eternity. And Paul calls us to think, when you see the constant uh, movement and tremors and life in even inanimate creation, it's as though the whole earth is groaning and waiting for its ultimate glorification. Not surprising that the rocks would be split and the earth would quake when Christ suffered and died. He defeated the enemy of souls, Satan. He atoned for sin. He made a new race possible. He made eternity and as a dwelling place for the people of God in the new heavens and the new earth possible. And all the earth would somehow tremor and jump it was such an occasion. So there's a meaning there, a significance in the rending of the rocks. But then it speaks about salvation also. If the veil being torn speaks about Christ's atoning death, shattering the barrier between man and God, then the rending of the rocks speaks of how God will go about it. You're a believer, and you love the Lord, and you long for him, and you pray to him daily, and you go by his word, and you struggle for holiness, and seek his help and blessing. Are all these things true of you? They weren't always true. There was a time when your heart was hard, like a rock, when you wouldn't listen, same with me, when we were resistant and wouldn't yield and wouldn't turn. First of all, Christ had to suffer and die for our sins, and then the Spirit had to come and smash the rock and melt us down and open our hearts and incline our wills. And when Christ died on Calvary, even the rocks were split. This is a new thing. People are going to be moved in their hundreds of thousands and millions around the world. And granite hearts are going to be broken and new hearts are going to be given to them. The symbolism around Calvary, if we have eyes to see it, is rich. Even the graves split in Jerusalem we read in Matthew's Gospel. Well, of course, that was a symbol that the grave of the believer is now split. He will not die forever. His soul will go to be with Christ and his body will be raised up at the last day. No grave can hold him. And the symbolism is there. But thirdly, I want to come to this 39th verse in Mark chapter 15. And when the centurion, which stood over against him, saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. If you see in the incidental symbols, first of all, the way that salvation was procured by the death of Christ. And you see how hearts are affected by being broken and softened and opened to Christ, 
by a work of the Spirit, then you see something of the nature of the response of the person who comes to Christ in the experience of the centurion. When the centurion, in charge of the detail, the detachment at the foot of the cross of Roman soldiers, saw that he so cried out. When he saw the cry of Christ, how he cried out to his father, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Comes from Psalm 39, verse 5. Into thy hands I commit, says the psalm, my spirit. It's a psalm of David. I've never heard this before, said the centurion. I never heard a person so speak to God the Father. Of course, he was a Roman. He was a polytheist of sorts. But the Father the one true and living God, as though he were his son. Father, what an intimate relationship. Father, into thy hand I commend my spirit. Said in confidence, prayed in certainty. When he saw this, this man knows where he's going. This man is the son of the Father. This man is calm and composed and dignified. His form runs with blood. He's been lashed until the wounds flowed with blood. He's been nailed to a cross. He's been humiliated and insulted in every conceivable way. He dies in agony and he speaks with certainty and calm and relationship. He knows his father. He was convinced by these things. He's recorded by Luke as having said, certainly, surely, this was a righteous man. Mark says, certainly, surely, truly, this was the son of God. He was who he was said to be. He was the son of God of God. The man made a profession of faith, if you like. Can't be absolutely certain of that, but he seems to be doing. He's convinced. And this illustrates, even on Calvary's cross, the way we come to Christ, to truly come to him. It's not enough to be a nominal Christian and to vaguely believe in him, to vaguely assent to him, That doesn't bring you to true conversion. There are many people in the world think they are Christians, but they've never really come to Christ. They've never truly repented of sin. They've never truly repented of their, uh, uh, turned their lives over to him. They've not known that inner change which comes about by the power of the Spirit, the new birth. They don't know these things because they've never really seen Christ like the centurion saw him. Certainly he's the son of God. Look at him and his composure and his holiness and purity and what he's doing. They're hurling these insults at him like the dying thief we read about in Luke's gospel. The centurion had heard a sermon. He heard the sermon from the lips of unbelievers, from the chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees. They didn't know it, but they were preaching a sermon to the dying thief, to the centurion in charge of the Roman detail, perhaps to all the Roman soldiers there, because it said in one gospel, that they all said this, surely he's the son of God. What was the sermon? Why the insults they were flinging into the teeth of Christ? You said 
you were the Son of God. You saved others. You are claiming to be the Messiah of God. You're claiming to be the Saviour. Save yourself. But the reaction of the centurion and the dying thief on the one side was, he's the Saviour then. This accounts for him. This accounts for what he's doing. A holy man, a healer of thousands. This accounts for his perfect deportment and composure, no matter what they do. This accounts for the way he speaks to his father in such a familiar, personal way. He's the saviour. He's the promised Messiah. The only person in the history of the world to have been prophesied before his birth and so many times and in great detail, including everything he would do. This is the Messiah of God. And that centurion had heard that dying thief witnessing to him, this man has done nothing amiss. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he'd heard those words of Christ. You will be with me this day in paradise. And I'm sure he believed all these things amounted to a sermon. You see on Calvary's cross the miracle of two hearts breaking. The heart of the dying thief softened as a rebel thief and possibly murderer too, an insurrectionist, turns his life over to Christ and that of the centurion. Truly this was a righteous man. Truly this was the Son of God. That's a profession of faith in Christ and possibly the other Roman soldiers also. Amazing things. What did that centurion see in total? Well, he, he saw the sufferings of Christ. He saw him saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Something special is going on here. This extraordinary man, they know not what they do. He came to realize they were crucifying their savior, but it had to happen. Then he saw the mother of Christ and the disciple John and Christ committing the care of his mother to the disciple John. And he thought to himself, who is this man? who cares more about his mother and her care and who speaks so gently when he's in agony and wounded and dying on this cross? Who is this holy man? Surely he is the Son of God, the Saviour of the world. And then the three hours darkness and all the jeers and the screams and the cries and the waving of arms and the anger and the fury. And that deep, deep, profound darkness for three hours and there is silence and the people cannot move and they cannot go home. There's no moonlight, there's no starlight. They have no lamps with them. There's not even the tiny amount of ambient light that is usually around unless you're in a dark room. And everyone was silenced. And this, even to a Roman centurion, was surely a token of judgment. This is astonishing. We've never read of this. We've never heard of this. And the impression upon him was this is surely the Son of God, my Saviour, my Lord, 
That's how you come to Christ. You don't say lightly to yourself, oh, I believe in Christ, and I believe he died on a cross, and I believe he's the Son of God. You feel it in your being. Dear friends, you say, this is the mighty and the everlasting, the holy God equal with the Father who became a man for a creature like me and who suffered and died for my sins. This is the Holy One. Oh, I've got it, I've grasped it. And he did this for someone who deserves only to die and only to be punished and only to be discarded from God for all eternity. And he did this for me. And you yield to him. We're seeing the appeals of Christ to the heart, even in the incidental events of the cross of Calvary, mighty as they are. Trust in him, friends. Trust in him. Think of those words, Lord, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Christ said them in complete confidence. He'd won the victory. He'd paid the price for sinners. Now he can return to the Father. But you know, he quoted that from a psalm where David was in deep trouble. David, the king of old, was slandered on every hand. They were plotting against him at court. He had been sick and very weakened. He was not able to stride the paving of the court in a usual manner. He had lost his authority because of infirmity. And now they've turned against him. And he casts himself upon the Lord. And he says in that psalm, God who has redeemed me and saved my soul, God who has promised me his loving kindness. And he comes to him and he says, into thy hand I commit my soul, my spirit. He places himself in the hands of God and God hears his prayer and delivers him. Well, we can use these words as we come to Christ. Not Christ as, quite as Christ used them in absolute faith and certainty that he was returning to his father, but more in the sense that David used them. In all my present troubles, I commit, commend my soul into the safekeeping of God. Believe in Christ. Believe he died for sinners. Repent of your sin. Hand over your life. And trust, trust. Commit your soul to Christ who suffered and died for sin. And you're safe. And you're saved and you're made new.